Okie dokie. Um, that happy sound. We are broadcasting live from Bee Works Tower on the outskirts of scenic Vineyard Haven. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Matt Pelican. I'm the director of the Martha's Vineyard Atlas of Life program at Biodiversity Works. Uh, to tonight's presentation, which is on mostly on sea ducks, I, I snuck a few puddle duckies in there too, uh, just for uh, for diversity's sake. Um, but tonight's presentation is sponsored by the Atlas of Life and Biodiversity Works and the Martha's Vineyard Bird Club. I should kind of untangle all of these entities so you know who is talking at you. But Atlas of Life is a project, the, a joint project of the uh, Betsy and Jesse Fink Family Foundation and Biodiversity Works. It is a project that aims to support naturalists uh, of all kinds on the vineyard, inspire and support naturalists of all kinds on the vineyard. And the program has been going for uh, about two years now. We have a website, we have some other uh, um, resources for naturalists. The Martha's Vineyard Bird Club is a, uh, a project of biodiversity works primarily, although it's very public and it's open to birders of all kinds, all levels on Martha's Vineyard. And it features uh, pretty regular walks, uh, some of which are aimed at beginners and some of which are aimed at more experienced observers. And if you go to the Biodiversity Works website and click the birding tab, birding on Martha's Vineyard, you can get to information about the, um, the Martha's Vineyard Bird Club. Um, the main thing I'm gonna do tonight is be sharing a, a PowerPoint. So I'll be sharing my screen in a second. Um, uh, I, 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 as I, I have a, a bad habit of doing this, I have like 6 million slides. There's no way we're going to be get, get, getting through all of them tonight. Uh, anything we don't cover tonight, uh, I will probably simply roll over into a second webinar that I'll do in uh, the rest of the vineyards waterfowl in a couple of weeks. Um, probably won't have time to do that before the Christmas bird count, but uh, which is on January 1st. But uh, we'll see how it goes. So anyway, I'm going to try sharing my screen. And uh, how does that look? Everybody seeing uh, screen share of the sea ducks of Martha's Vineyard? Anybody, anybody, just give me a verbal confirmation that you can see what I think you can see. Yeah, that's good. Great, thank you. Um, okay, I talked a little bit about those entities whose logos are down at the bottom. And um, I'd like to just very briefly go over, if people could, uh, if people could mute themselves, that would be helpful. Um, eBird or eBird. Uh, if people could mute themselves, please. We're getting a uh, cross chat. Thanks. So eBird, eBird is a uh, community science platform that's aimed for birders. It's, it has in, uh, uh, enormous capacity for uh, compiling data and you can use it to keep your checklists and add your checklist to a platform that uh, uh, merges your data with other people for research purposes. More and more birders are using it uh, in the field. You can use a, an application on your smartphone to keep a, a checklist while you're birding. So it definitely is worth checking out. Um, iNaturalist is a platform that is more general uh, for naturalists of all kinds. And it does, in contrast to eBird, it does require Data be that data be submitted basically with either a photograph or a recording, and that can make it a little bit complicated for um, uh, for birders because it's often hard to get pictures of things. But it has the advantage that there is both artificial intelligence and human beings that will help you identify things. So if you put up a picture of a bird on INAT, it, it will likely be identified for you within within moments. Um, the CDUC joint venture website is mainly useful for uh, biology and conservation. It has really good species accounts for most of the CDUC species that we'll be talking about tonight. A good informational resource. I mentioned the uh, 
birding section, birding MV on biodiversity works website and the Martha's Vineyard Atlas of Life in its species lists section has some pretty extensive resources for birds on Martha's Vineyard, a checklist. Uh, there is breeding bird survey data up there. There will be Christmas bird count data up there at some point. Um, and also while you're at the uh, uh, Martha's Vineyard Atlas of Life website, you can check out the resources section because there is a webinar in there that Shea Fee led a few months back on how to use eBird. So lots of material there. Um, other resources that you're gonna want for, for birding, um, a decent field guide, that kind of goes without saying. If you don't have one, you definitely wanna pick one up. There are a bunch of good ones out there. Um, my recommendation is to study your field guide before you go into the field with it and after. Use it as a learning resource. Don't just get out in the field and expect that you're going to be able to use it effectively. You have to know how it's organized. You have to know how to use it. There are there are also innumerable websites and print books relating to, to bird watching. Um, all of those will be helpful, none of which will answer every one of your questions. Can we can people mute themselves, please? Um, Issue stuff. Yeah, it'd be helpful if people could mute themselves. Push the mute button. Okay. Um, but the fact of the matter is that uh, with any kind of print resource or web resource, sometimes birds don't really look like the pictures. So ultimately, you're going to have to learn how to do things in the field. Um, yeah, I'm checking my. Uh, settings here for just one second. Okay. Um, I'm not going to talk much about optics or anything like that. Uh, binoculars are pretty much necessary for bird wa for duck watching because you're going to be doing a lot of it at long range. Keep your lenses clean. Um, I'm not going to uh, teach you how to do that, but it's important to have everything working well. Um, a spotting scope is also extremely useful for duck watching, although, you know, I find myself going with just binoculars more and more often. I guess I'm getting lazy. Um, photography, if you are equipped for it, is a great resource both for documenting things and for learning because you can, um, you can look at photos and uh, sometimes it's easier to identify something from a photo than in real life. And one little tip in case you need to uh, document something, if you're really interested in getting a picture of something and you don't have a camera with you, you can often get a passable picture by bracing your binoculars and using your smartphone camera to take a picture through one of the barrels of your binoculars. It won't be a great photograph, but if you found something rare and you just want to get a picture to document it, that is often better than nothing. <clears throat> uh, I would say that one characteristic of seabird watching in general is that you spend a lot of time looking through your optics. You're often scanning, you're often studying big flocks of things. And if things are not adjusted properly, you will find yourself getting eye strain in the course of a day. So learn how to uh, adjust your binoculars. Really, when you're using binoculars, you shouldn't be straining at all. It should be like looking out a window only. It's a window in which everything is nice and close to you. And uh, if you don't know how to set your uh, diopters on your binoculars, maybe go to a, a, a Vineyard Bird Club walk and ask a more exp experienced observer to teach you how to do that. So lots of resources out there, lots of tools, but ultimately the most important resource is your brain. Um, you need to train your brain to ask the right questions and notice the right things in the field. And basically the goal is to do more with less. Anybody can identify uh, adult male duck in breeding plumage that sits still in front of you at close distance in good light. The problem is that that's often not what you see. So as you get more and more experienced as a birder, you'll find that you'll be able to make an a confident identification from less and less information until eventually you can do it from you know, call notes of songbirds and um, distant ducks that show only very uh, limited patterns of black and white. Um, 
there are lots of ways to learn, but ultimately you need to put the work in. Um, spend time on individual birds. Don't just check them off when you see them and move on to the next one. Really study them. Take some time to appreciate what they look like. Bird often and bird with people every chance you get, um, especially but not only with more experienced birders. Birders are very generous. They like to help. They like to share their knowledge. So again, uh, vineyard bird club events can be a very good way to learn. Um, <clears throat> Work every bird, but give up on the idea of identifying every single bird that you see to species. Um, can people mute themselves, please? I, if I knew how to mute, mute everybody, I would do it, but uh, I don't want to interrupt the flow of things here. So please just click the mute button on your, on your screen. Um, Learn the common birds before you worry about finding rarities. The way you find a rarity is it doesn't look right. It's something is that it's not one of the usual suspects. So until you have a sense for what the usual suspects are and what they can look like, the full range of their diversity of appearances, you're not really equipped to, to go uh, worrying about rarities very much and fight against the impulse to turn things into rarities. Everybody likes to find rarities, but you really, what you really wanna do is ask yourself, why can't that bird be something common? Don't ask yourself why, why it isn't a, a rarity. You, know, you wanna start with ruling out the expected things. Um, an aberrant common bird is much more common than uh, a genuine rarity, a normal looking rarity. So be really, really cautious. Um, you're never going to be totally error free as a birder, but uh, every mis misidentification, particularly if it's of a rare or significant species, really clouds the picture of where things occur and when they occur. So your goal as a birder is to be as accurate, accurate as you possibly can be. Whoops, there we go. Um, lots of places on the vineyard to Watch ducks, pretty much any place on the, uh, the shoreline will have ducks in the winter at, 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 at some level. Um, but I'd like to call out a couple of particularly important locations that you should try visiting. Um, the first is certainly the, the cliffs at Gay Head. <clears throat> can be really large numbers of birds over the boulder fields uh, offshore from there. Lobsterville is really good. Um, a lot of scoters, a lot of eiders there. Um, don't forget to check out Menemsha Pond from the, the Red Beach area, um, also very good. Um, West Chop and East Chop are both worth a visit. Um, in, uh, also, the, uh, the opening of Tashmu, although the road going out there is just hideous, um, the outer part of Lake Tashmu and the water off the uh, opening there can be very productive. Um, the beach road from Vineyard Haven out towards East Chop, from Five Corners out to each East Chop is really good. Uh, there's the apron by the seawall that gives you a good vantage point on the outer harbor. And across the road, the boat landing gives you a good vantage point of a good portion of the lagoon. Um, the beach road from Oak Bluffs to Edgartown is often productive. Again, both sides, uh, the Senjik and Tackett side and Farm Pond side and the ocean side can be productive. Um, and Eel Pond, which is best viewed from the, the boat landing in Edgartown, uh, is a great place for ducks. <clears throat> and I like to also, a lot of people don't check it out, but uh, Wilson's Landing, I think it's called, the, the town boat landing on uh, the, the Edgartown Great Pond. Uh, that cove is often very ducky. So a lot of scop there, it's a good place for, uh, for scop and, um, some of the other sort of brackish water birds. Um, and finally, well, Sepiesa Point. Um, again, the boat landing down at the end of Sepiesa Point gives a good vantage point on the Tisbury Great Pond. And finally, Squib Nocket, the parking lot there is uh, often very productive. There are a couple of species there, notably harlequin ducks, that are much easier to find there than anywhere else on the vineyard. If you have a way to get into Squib Nocket, Squib Nocket Point is also really, really good. Uh, it's a very private place, though, so it can be uh, be hard to gain access. Um, these are a couple of puddle ducks, and I had to sneak them in, even though we're focus focusing mostly on, on ducks that winter on salt water. 
But I wanted to make a point with these two uh, photographs. And I mean, you look at them and they're mighty similar birds. And as a beginning bird or even an intermediate, intermediate birder, you might say, well, how am I ever gonna tell these things apart? But if you look closely, you start realizing that there are in fact a lot of differences between them. Um, starting at the front of the bird, just notice that the head shape is different. The, the forehead is much steeper in this green wing teal. Uh, the bill is a little shorter um, than it is on the blue wing teal on the right. Um, they both have a, a streak through the eye, but notice that the green wing teal has a second streak below it. Um, the sides of the birds look pretty different. Um, on, the, on the blue wing teal, you've got dark feather centers with a very neat edge around it. So it looks kind of scaly. It's a very uniform scaly appearance on the bird. But on the green wing teal, these feathers here, the, the margins are a little irregular and the centers of the feathers have some uh, light pigmentation in them. So it's a much more modeled and less uniformly scaly picture. Um, the blue winged blue patch on the wing that gives the blue winged teal its name shows a little bit, as does the green winged patch on the green winged teal. Um, the, a female blue wing does not have that, what's called a speculum. It's really the secondary flight feathers. And finally, note this little pale streak here at the base of the tail on the green winged teal. So when you really get down and dirty and study these birds, um, as similar as they look initially and superficially, in fact, there are a lot of characteristics that distinguish them. And all of those things that I pointed out are pretty reliable field marks. You might not know that the first time you study them, but after you've looked at, at a few dozen green wing teal and blue wing teal, you start to realize that um, uh, start to realize that there are a lot of ways to tell these birds apart. So even if you're looking at an angle that only shows you the face of the bird, or even maybe just even shows you the profile with no detail at all, you can still tell the difference. And you'll see that they really kind of sort themselves out when they're in a mixed flock. So don't despair, uh, this can be done. It can be challenging, but uh, with experience and with, uh, with application, you really will be able to learn how to do some uh, very difficult identifications. One of my favorite identification stories, years ago, I was birding with a guy named John Dunn, who some of you may have heard of. Uh, he's probably one of the best birders in the world. Um, and we were walking along the place in Colorado and all of a sudden he said, two hooded mergansers. And a moment later from behind us, two hooded mergansers came by and he had identified them by the particular whistle of their wings. And, and he knew that there were two because those whistles were a little bit out of sync with each other. That's fine quality birding. Andrew, I, I, it's maybe not easy to be that good. But, uh, um, so it can be done. You just need to apply yourself. All right, let's look at some ducks. Um, this, we're gonna start with the most uh, probably the most easy to see of the sea ducks on the vineyard, the bufflehead. It's a very, very common species. I've been seeing uh, hundreds of them uh, just around uh, the birding that I've been doing around Oak Bluffs and Edgartown and Vineyard Haven. They occur both on, um, I'm gonna actually back up a little bit. I wanna talk about a couple of things before I go into the, the duck end of things here. Um, that the challenges of sea ducks, you know, is we, with a buffle head like this, a view like this, you're not gonna have a hard time telling what that bird is. The problem is you're often seeing birds at a very long distance. You're seeing them in bad light. You're seeing them intermittently as they dive or as they bob up and down on a rough sea. Um, you may, they may be backlit by a sun, it makes it hard to see any detail. So don't just worry about the field marks on a bird. I mean, here there are obviously a lot of field marks that really matter, but think about structure of birds, how they're shaped. Um, is the bill skinny? Is the bill long? Is the bill short? Is the head uh, have a steep forehead or a sloping forward? 
forehead, um, and also be alert to behavioral cues. Um, for example, scop are notorious for packing closely together into a really tight flock when they're on the water. And you can recognize a scop flock with practice from a long, long ways away. <laughs> um, uh, Red-breasted mergansers often forage in uh, a coordinated way, all diving at once and in the same direction and sort of herding bait fish along. You can see that happening a mile away and know that you're looking at a flock of red-breasted mergansers. So we're gonna talk a lot about marks here, but we're also gonna talk a lot about structure and about some of the other things that will help you uh, identify these things, all right? So about the bufflehead, um, they do occur on both salt water and fresh water, but generally they like pretty calm water. You're not gonna get them on really high energy shorelines. Um, this photograph is a really good one because it shows that the white on the sides of the birds goes all the way around the back. It crosses the base of the tail. So this black area on the back of the bird is kind of like an island floating on white. And of course, the bird has a very steep forehead and this big white patch on the side of the head. A pretty unmistakable bird when you see it. Um, the females, like the one on the right, are a lot drabber, but they show this really prominent um, white spot on the side of the head. And they also show that same characteristic, very steep forehead shape. But otherwise, they show a lot less white. And this can be, this gray can actually be pretty dark on, on, a, on a, a female buffalo head. Um, but that uh, contrasting white patch on the ear shows up at, at very, very long distances and under really difficult position conditions. So it's a great uh, field mark to keep in mind. Um, in flight, uh, buffalo heads, because they're such small small birds, have very, very fast wing beats. They tend to fly in closely packed flocks for the most part, and the bird is it's a gregarious species to start with. Note on these males that there's a lot of white on the wing. There's a band that runs all the way across the inner wing and that those white head patches are very, very visible even in flight. The female, the white is restricted. Um, sometimes it's not even really there at all. So you get a feeling for a, a mixed flock of buffalo heads. You have birds that are sort of dark gray and maybe show just a little white on the head with birds that show a great deal of white and they'll all be the same size and they'll all be the same structure. And that's a good indication that you've got uh, buffalo heads. Um, this is more like what you're likely to see in the field. And you can see we've got a female here with a very prominent white patch on the side of her head, a couple more females, and then a couple of males with that characteristic white all along the waterline and black showing, um, uh, so there's an island on the, uh, floating on the white uh, of the sides and that black uh, head patch. This is probably a coot over here, so ignore that one. Um, so terrible photograph, but perfectly adequate for identifying uh, these as buffalo heads with 100% certainty. And while I haven't said it yet, I should have said, as a birder, it's really important to distinguish between 100% certainty and 99.9% .9 certainty. Uh, there's nothing wrong with 99% certainty. It, it's just that you don't wanna say something definitely was something if it really wasn't. So just be really careful of, uh, sort of how positive you actually are of an identification. Even worse buffalo head picture, this is really terrible, but still you got black, an island of black floating on white and a big white prominent patch on the head. Uh, no question in my mind whatsoever that that's a male buffalo head. So this is a bird that you're gonna get a lot, of, a lot of practice on and you're gonna use it as a sort of point of comparison as you start to learn other birds. Um, is it bigger than a buffalo head? Does it show a different pattern of white on the head than a buffalo head does? And so on. Uh, this is a, what a stunning picture that is. Uh, uh, this is a bird you're not gonna have much problem with if you see a male in good light. This is a harlequin duck. Uh, beautiful, beautiful male bird. This chestnut patch often stands out. Um, these are fairly small ducks. They're about the size of a buffalo head, maybe a little bit bigger. Uh, males have this white patch here and 
very clearly defined white stripes that will show up. You'll be amazed at how far away you can see those stripes. Uh, the chestnut patch often isn't visible at long distance. It'll just like this whole area, area is black. Um, <clears throat> the buffle heads are what are called torrent ducks. Torrent, like is a, a torrent of water. And they nest on, uh, on rivers, uh, high energy rivers and do their foraging in rapids. So they're used to high energy water and it's not too surprising then that you often find them on exposed coastlines, uh, often on rocky shoreline because they really prefer um, rocks. Interesting uh, population situation. The, the west coast population of harlequin ducks is fairly good size, but the east coast one that breeds up in eastern Canada and the maritime provinces is only about 10,000 birds. Uh, the more northerly of those winter in Greenland, so we never get to see them. But about 2,000 birds is estimated winter on the, uh, the east coast from probably the maritime provinces down to about Maryland. Now, the counts on the vineyard have been as high as 120 birds sometimes. So if you if you think of the whole that whole population that winters here um, as being 2,000 birds, this is a pretty significant wintering site for that population of harlequin ducks. So uh, in a conservation perspective, it's a, we're an, in pretty, a pretty important site for them. Um, I think they're getting more and more common on the vineyard, or maybe they're just starting to use additional sites, but they used to be pretty much restricted to Squib Knocket Point, and uh, they still are very common out there if you can get out there. Uh, feeding on the boulder fields, but uh, they're turning up now pretty regularly at Squibnocket parking lot, the beach parking lot. Uh, I get them probably every other year on the Christmas count at West Chop. I've had one once or twice at the breakwaters in Oak Bluffs, but this is not a bird, a species that you're ever going to see in a place like South Beach, where you've got no rocks offshore. You've just got uh, unconsolidated sand on the bottom there. It definitely is a bird that associates with rocks pretty much wherever it is. Uh, Gay Head is another place for them on the boulder fields um, off of Gay Head. Females are much, much drabber, and they often appear like pretty much just a uniform gray bird at a distance, except that they show this really clear white patch on the back of the head, and that's going to show up at prodigious distances sometimes. The white patch in the front is a little bit more variable, but it's usually there to some extent. And of course, both sexes have a fairly short stubby bill relative to some of our other ducks. Um, these uh, uh, harlequin ducks often form uh, dense flocks. They seem to do it less here uh, than they do on, on the boulder fields, than they do on uh, places like in Essex County, Massachusetts, where they winter along sea cliffs. But you often get uh, flocks like this with a, a bunch of optimistic males chasing a couple of uh, not so interested females. And another characteristic, when these birds are flocked up tightly like this, they will usually dive pretty much in sync with each other. The, uh, over the course of three or four seconds, all of them will go boop, 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 boop underwater. And then 15 or 20 seconds later, they'll come pop, 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 up again uh, in a synchronized manner. And that is a characteristic habit. If you're on a rocky shoreline and you see a distant flock of ducks doing that, it's almost certain that you've got a, a bunch of harlequin ducks that distance. 99% certain, not 100%. Um, <clears throat> terrible picture, but no mistaking these harlequin ducks. Here are those, uh, the, the white stripes in the front of the face and on the breast and in front of the wing. They stand out at really uh, long distances. So this is uh, to get that, that pattern in your brain and you'll be able to recognize this, the males of this species very easily. And again, a bad picture of a female. Um, <clears throat> but see how clearly that eye spot stands out in spite of the fact that the light is bad. It's probably, it might be a little bit foggy when this was taken. Um, so pretty easy bird to recognize. Um, Common eider is another species that you're going to see a lot of on the vineyard. It's one of probably uh, can be the most common of our sea ducks. 
it's a massive, massive heavy bird. It's the heaviest duck in the world, a uh, duck species in the world. And you notice that heaviness on the water. They, they, they seem like they're uh, uh, ballasted out there. They just don't bob with the same buoyancy that a lot of other ducks do. And males and females, as this photograph shows, are extremely different from each other. Adult males are extensively black at the waterline, but extensively white on the back. So you might say that they're in some ways, they're an inverse of the pattern of a bufflehead. And they have this uh, black cap, beautiful uh, roseate flush on the breast and some sort of greenish on the back of the head. Those are not particularly useful field marks. You need to get a really good look at the bird to see those. So if you don't see them, don't, uh, don't let that distract you. Uh, females are much drabber, uh, showing this uh, barred pattern. The, the color brown in females and young uh, immature birds varies pretty widely from this sort of reddish to a much flatter brown. So again, expect some variation in, the, in these birds. Um, Notice the way that the, the, what's called the culmin, the top edge of the beak is very straight and kind of merges up onto the forehead of the bird. And that the feathers of the face extend way out along the, the beak. That's a really characteristic feature of the common eider. And it's a very, very good field mark when you can see it. Um, a lot of birds, uh, like a lot of ducks, they take a, they go through several molts as they're reaching maturity. So you see a lot of birds that are uh, not full adults, and uh, they'll look something like this: various patchy combinations of black and white. But they'll be the same size as an adult bird, and they'll have this same sort of Roman nose and the feathering extending way out onto the. Uh, out of the bill, that very characteristic head shape that stands out at, at, at pretty long distances. This is kind of a typical view of a flock of, uh, of common eiders. This, this is kind of how you would see them through your binoculars looking from the gay head cliffs. And you can see it's a mix of males and females, or at least female type birds. Um, notice on the female that the, the, there's a wing patch that has white on either side of it. And see how that, uh, you may not be able to see it on your screen, but on some of these females, you can actually see that even in this picture. I can see it anyway. But this is characteristic. They're not, they don't pack really densely when they flock up ordinarily like harlequin ducks. But uh, you can see these birds, you know, white on top, black at the waterline, black cap, uh, very big, heavy ducks. Um, and the sort of the very strong sexual dimorphism of black and white males and almost uniformly brown females is a pretty good uh, indicator of common eiders. Really bad picture, but no question, well, not, not a bad picture, a distant picture. No question that that bird is an adult male common eider. White on the back, black at the waterline, and black cap. And you can even kind of get a sense of the head shape on that bird. So this is a duck that you can recognize with a little practice from a mile away. And, I, and I'm not exaggerating. I mean, with, with decent optics and decent lighting conditions, uh, a flock of eider is incredibly recognizable. Um, we have a second eider species, the king eider. It's a very, very rare bird. Um, you reported much less than annually, but as you get to be a better birder, this is one you want to keep an eye out for. Uh, if you come across an adult male like these, you're unlikely to mistake it for anything. It will grab you by the head and give you a good vigorous shake. Um, just a, a incredibly beautiful duck and incredibly striking appearance. Um, a lot of birds that show up in Massachusetts where this is just not a very common species are not adult males and that's where things get tricky. Uh, this is an immature male. And you could see how you might be able to confuse this with a common eider. Um, but notice that the, the, the shape of the bill is different. Instead of being pretty much straight coming down off of the forehead, it's decidedly concave. And notice that the little lobe of feathers here doesn't extend very far out on the bill like it does on the common eider. 
a lot of variability in what is white and what is black on this bird. So you really need to do it with structure and uh, do the ID with structure. And if possible, a look at the face of the bird. Uh, this is what females look like. Um, again, the, the, the feathering extends out into a sort of triangle, but not way out on the bill like on a common eider and you have a, this concave culmen here, um, which is very, very different from the head shape of a, um, a common eider. I don't have a lot of experience with, uh, with king eiders. I don't, most bat birders in New England don't, but in my experience, this flat top of the head is a structural characteristic that's pretty reliable in, in a female common, uh, I mean, a female king eider. And so if you're looking through a flock of, uh, of common eiders, female, a female king eider can stand out pretty well because of that flat head and the bill shape, and it'll be a much smaller, significantly smaller bird uh, uh, than, a, than a female common eider. And I can tell you, you do see uh, king eiders alone, and you do see them with scoters instead of with common eiders. So be alert for this bird. Um, you, if, uh, if you don't have a, a well-established reputation, uh, you're going to have a hard time persuading people that you really did see a female king eider. But if you can get a picture, um, and if you can, uh, it, it'll help. And if you can get somebody else to see the bird, uh, that's, uh, it's a bird that's worth documenting. It's a significant find on the vineyard. So definitely something to keep an eye out for. Uh, we have two golden eye species on the vineyard. These are medium sized ducks. Uh, the common golden eye is by far the more common of the two. 99.9% .9 of the golden eyes that you see are going to be this species. Um, this is an adult male. Uh, they're mostly going to be found on salt water, although you do get them on brackish water somewhat. It's, it's, it's a, a tends to be a, a open water bird though. Um, note the shape of the head, which is almost triangular, um, sort of a sloping forehead and a sloping back of the head. Round patch here. Uh, the golden eye will show up actually pretty well. You'd be surprised how far away you can see that. It's a, it's a useful field mark, but I wouldn't put too much stock in it. And there's black on the back, it's fairly narrow. There isn't a lot of black on the back of this bird. This a lot of a lot of, of the, the side of the bird is white, and there is this very narrow black streaking on the side of the wing. And that's important. This is an important part of this bird to pay attention to, because the other golden eye looks quite different in that part of the body. Um, interesting thing about. Uh, golden eyes is they often spend the, a good part of the winter in uh, single sex flocks. They segregate into flocks. Uh, this is a female and I would caution you that this white, which is all on the wing, um, can vary in extent pretty dramatically depending on how the wing is being held. Sometimes it's not visible at all. Sometimes it's quite extensive. Um, but you'll note that it's a much grayer bird than, uh, than the adult male. And there's often a little bit of yellow at the tip of the beak. Sometimes they're all black, but it's never extensively yellow in common golden eye. And that's another characteristic that you want to take note of because it's a really important ID feature. Um, head shape is pretty similar from uh, males and females. Uh, so this is a pretty typical presentation of a small group of common golden eyes on the vineyard. See that triangular head? It's almost like a, uh, like a equilateral triangle. Um, pretty clearly defined white spot on the male, uh, extensive white side with just a little black on the bird. And uh, this, these may actually be immature males. It's hard to tell what they are in this species, but note that this bird doesn't show any white at all on the side. So that's an example of how gray female type uh, common eiders can look. This is the other uh, common eiders, three common golden eyes. Uh, just listen to what I mean to say, not what I do say. Uh, this is the other golden eye. This is the Barrows golden eye, a very a tolerably rare bird here. They're, they're recorded probably annually on the vineyard, but it's rare to see one more at a time. And there are a lot of days when you go birding and you don't see any of them at all. Um, 
Compare this area of the male, the black extends much further down onto the side and the white is much more restricted within that black area. Whoopsie. From that to that, the forehead is much, much, much steeper. And the spot in front of the eye is crescent shaped instead of round. So a lot of differences. Uh, also note that whereas the iridescence on the common golden eye is kind of greenish, it's actually purplish on the Barrow's golden eye. That's a feature that will help in really good light, but at long distances or in, ba in bad light is not going to be much, uh, much good. Um, female Barrow's golden eyes have much more yellow on the bill than female common golden eyes. And that's pretty much the, uh, the way you're going to have to tell them apart. Uh, birds on the West Coast are often all yellow. Um, East Coast birds, this could be, I can't tell which this is. Um, but there's much more yellow than you usually see on a uh, common golden eye female. We do sometimes get an immature male barrows, uh, but again, even though this is gray instead of black, it's pretty extensive. And even though this spot is not fully formed, it's crescent shaped instead of round and the forehead is pretty steep. So no question that that's a female, I mean, a, a immature male uh, barrows. It's a good comparison of a female barrows, probably a West Coast bird with that entirely yellow bill and a female a common golden eye. Uh, the steep head shape is a good characteristic. And these look a little bit darker to me. There's something I haven't ever really been able to pin down, but um, they definitely look a little bit different. Um, and I can't see, I have to move something around so I can see what I need to show you in this, uh, this picture. But we've got some common golden eyes, typical males, a round white spot, typical probably a female here with a white stripe. And the male golden eyes are showing uh, very limited black. But look at this bird over at the right of the frame. And notice that the amount of black is just a little bit more extensive than we see on these other male golden eyes. And that this white patch in front of the eye looks too long. It's crescent shaped, it's not round. So that is actually an adult male Barrow's golden eye that would be easy to overlook. In fact, I did overlook it. Uh, I didn't have my binoculars with me. I took this picture and I went home and when I looked at the pictures, I thought, oh, geez, I just blew a, a male Barrow's golden eye. Um, but this is how it's going to look in the field. This is what you're going to need to sort of be dealing with. Um, with luck, that bird will eventually turn broadside and you'll be able to see what's, uh, get, get a better view of the, the crescent shaped markings. But this is the kind of thing that you need to uh, work on um, recognizing in the field. Okay, on to the scoters. Um, we have three scoter species here. Uh, they're very common birds. They're sort of mid-sized, a little bit bigger than golden eyes, a little bit smaller than common eiders. Um, this is a black scoter, an adult male. And the characteristic of the black scoter is that in all of its plumages, it never, ever, ever shows real white. Um, males have this remarkable orange doorknob at the base of the bill that can show up. At, we'll see some pictures later on that, that show how dramatically that can stand out even at pretty long distances. But um, there never is any actual white on the birds. The females do have some pale on the side of the face like these two birds do, but um, it's not white. It doesn't really stand out as white. And note the really sharp contrast between the pale face and the black crown on these birds. Um, and at most, just a hint of some white patches. So these are female black scoter. A bad picture of a flock of all black scoters. It's a, it's a mix. There are adult. Uh, some of these are females. Some of them are males, adult males. But none of them show any real white. And you can identify this species out at artillery range when they're flying past because they just don't show any white at all. And uh, 
you can rule out the other, uh, other scoter species. Another view of black scoters under difficult conditions, all black. They just don't show any white at all. Uh, big, good sized birds, powerful flyers, um, often flying low over the water. Scoter number two is the surf scoter. This is a fairly common species here as well. Um, easily viewed in, uh, there's usually some of them around um, in Vineyard Haven Harbor where you can get a good look at them. And note the pattern of a white patch on the nape and on the forehead, and then this remarkable bill with uh, spots of a white, white patch and a, and a black spot on it. Uh, not likely to mistake this bird if you see it in good light. But the females are a little bit more challenging. And, uh, the, the real, uh, in some ways, the most difficult uh, ID question that we have here is telling female surf scoters from female white wing scoters, which is the species we'll look at in a minute. And note in this on this bird that the feathering extends a little bit out on top of the bill, but it really, this is actually bill. This is not feathering as far as I know. And this is bill and that's feathering, but the feathering really doesn't extend out onto the bill. So this white spot, which is a marking on the feathering of the bird, ends abruptly at the base of the bill. It sometimes is followed up by a whitish patch on the bill itself, but usually you can see a gap between the two. And also uh, on a surf scoter, there is this ear patch and a black cap appearance suggestive of a female black scoter, but a female black scoter would never show that much white on the side of the head. Um, so again, these are under somewhat difficult lighting conditions. These are all uh, um, surf scoters, ear patch, a white patch that stops at the base of the bill and a capped appearance. Um, <clears throat> the males show up, show this, uh, nape patch at very, very long distances. And uh, that's how one way you can tell these birds from uh, a black scoter, even at, at very considerable distances. Um, our third scoter is a white wing scoter compared to, a uh, this is an adult male compared to an adult male surf scoter. And this is the only of our scoter species that show uh, a white patch on the wings, the secondary fe the flight feathers on the trailing edge of the wing. Males often show also this, uh, this white comma mark on the eye, but aside from the wing patch and the comma mark, they're black. Uh, they're pretty much black birds. All, all of the scoters are very, very dark ducks overall. And uh, this is a bird that, uh, it's a female white wing scoter. And you can see how it's difficult to tell the difference between this and uh, a surf scoter. But this white patch, which is on the feathers, extends out onto the bill. And that's a useful field mark. It, it, the head is more uniform. It doesn't have that capped appearance. Um, and that's a useful field mark. But the real clincher is the fact that there is this white patch on the wing. It isn't always visible. But if you watch a white wing scoter in any plumage for any length of time, you will eventually get a flash of white here, and that will be enough to clinch the identification. Uh, flock in flight, again, uh, this will show up at enormous distances. A um, <clears throat> good way to practice these birds is at Gay Head, where you often have uh, large numbers of scoters of all three species, sometimes flying, sometimes sitting on the water. Um, and you can really get a lot of good practice in there, viewing them at long distances under challenging conditions, and that's really the way to learn. So black surf, white winged scoters, all of them are dark birds, but how the white is distributed is the important thing to note in, in looking at them. Um, mixed scoter flock, um, you can see this is uh, uh, over here, the second bird from the left is an adult black scoter. See how that orange doorknob shows up even at amazing distances. Uh, these two are female black scoters. Here's another adult black scoter. Here's a female white wing. 
and then there are a couple of birds that I would need to spend some more time on to tell what they are. Uh, that's probably a white winged scoter. Uh, that's probably a female black scoter. That's probably a male black scoter. That's a female black scoter. But you can see how they, uh, the, 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 those marks that we've looked at actually show up pretty dramatically, even when you're looking at these birds at a, a fairly long distance. Um, I think we have time to talk about the scop today. Uh, we have two species of scop here, greater and lesser. Um, these are birds that are sort of brackish water birds. Uh, the greater is, its affinity is more towards salt water than, uh, than fresh water. The lesser scop is more likely on fresh water, but they both turn up on the brackish water of the great ponds. Um, it's worth remembering that greater scop is much, much, much more common than lesser. So it's the default species here. You have to, to, to really uh, identify a lesser scop. You really need to rule out greater firmly. Uh, you will sometimes see flocks of them, particularly on a freshwater pond or on a great pond. But most of the scop that you see on the vineyard, particularly on pure salt water, uh, are going to be greater scop. Um, adult males of both species have this sort of wonderful vermiculated black and white back, which shows gray, but it's not black at a distance. Extensive white on the flank, and uh, the head shape is, is going to be a really important thing. So structure is really important for telling these two species apart. Classic view of a greater scop here. Uh, a couple more, and notice how on all of these birds, the highest point on the forehead, on the head, is well forward of the center line of the head. It's like the head is kind of leaning forward a little bit. Um, and that's going to be a really critical feature for telling the scop apart. Um, both species have the same general pattern of a vermiculated back and white flanks and black at the front and back. Um, females of both species have an extensive white patch uh, in front of the, the eye. And uh, both species show this blue bill, although in, in adult birds, although the blue, the bill is smaller a little bit in a lesser scop. But uh, these are for a uh, greater scop. This, in contrast, is what uh, typical lessers look like. And note that the high point is a little bit farther back and there is actually even kind of a little bump on the back of the heads of these birds. The bills are a little bit smaller. The white patch here is a little bit less extensive on the female. And if you saw them together, um, you, would, uh, you would see that these are a little bit smaller than greater scop. It's, uh, it's marginal, but it's often apparent in the field. And I will say that I often struggle more with a single species flock of scop than I do with a mixed species a flock of scop. A single uh, lesser scop in a flock of greater scop often stands out pretty dramatically. I wouldn't say like a sore thumb, but you'll, you'll really notice it sometimes. And uh, sometimes when you're looking at a flock of, of single species flock of scop, it's like, what are they? I just can't tell. I just can't get a fix on the head shape. So a thing to keep in mind. Typical presentation of how we see greater scop on the vineyard, uh, a fairly dense flock. They're very gre 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 gregarious birds, uh, pack even usually more closely than this on the water. Um, and you can see on all of the birds that I can really have an opinion on, the, the characteristic shape of the, the head of the, the bird having its highest point forward like the head is leaning forward. I'm, I'm pretty confident that all of these birds are greater scop. And I counted them as such. This was from a Christmas bird count a couple of years ago on Vineyard Haven Harbor. Another really uh, important feature for telling scop apart is identifying them in flight, which sometimes can actually be easier than identifying sitting birds. Um, note that on both of these species, and the circled ones are greater and the uncircled one is a lesser, 
But then on all of these birds, there is a sort of a, a white streak on the trailing edge of the wing that starts at the base of the wing and then extends out a ways onto the wing before it merges into dark feathers. And it ends up, the white area ends abruptly right there on the lesser scob and extends a little bit farther out onto the primary flight feathers of the greater scob. And this may sound like a really arcane feature, and it, and it is. You're going to struggle to see this for a long time. And then one day, it's going to suddenly pop. And it's like, oh, I get it. And you'll see it. And ever after that, it's going to be a useful field mark for you. Um, greater scop, the, 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 the white doesn't usually show up this well. It's kind of a relic of the photograph. but that white extends way out onto the primary flight feathers. So those are graders. The white stops very abruptly at the edge of the secondaries and the, the primaries are all gray. This is a lesser scop that stands out pretty dramatically. Beautiful photograph of a female or female type greater scop showing um, white extending out onto the uh, primary feathers of the wing. Um, and one more bird I think we have time for, and, and that's the uh, the ringneck duck. Scop-like, blackhead, uh, uh, extensive pale coloration on the side, but instead of being vermiculated on the back, it's a good solid black in an adult ringneck uh, duck. The ring you can actually see in this photograph in keeping with the habit of naming birds after the least obvious feature. Uh, it's just kind of a bronzish ring around the base of the bird's neck. You almost never see that in the field. So ignore the name on this species. Colorful pattern on the bill and a vaguely scop-like head shape, but it's a much more upright head. It's like tall and narrow and often a little bit fuzzy on the top, which you don't really ever see on, uh, uh, on most of our scops. So this is an adult male uh, ringneck duck. This is a species that really prefers fresh water. You will sometimes see them on brackish water or even salt water, but uh, look for them at the, uh, like the Cranberry Acres Pond is a place that usually has a good population of them in the winter as long as the pond is open. Um, females look quite a bit like female scop, uh, only the markings on the face are more diffuse. You often end up with uh, an eye ring and sometimes a little white trailing mark on the uh, uh, side of the head and a two-tone but very dull appearance on the side of the bird. Um, and I want to point out on this picture, it doesn't show up very well, but if you see the, the sort of gray vermiculation on the side, and note that those little fine gray markings stop right before you get up to the front of the, to the breast here. So there is an area that looks whiter uh, before you get to the actual black coloration on the breast of the bird. And look at how that pops in this picture. <clears throat> All of these uh, male ringneck ducks show a black back and a grayish side with a really distinctive white crescent um, behind the black breast. Uh, this will stand out even through binoculars at very, very long distances and allow you to recognize this bird at, a, at an extensive uh, long range. Common bird, uh, not a, really abundant here, but they're regularly present through the winter as long as there is open water. Um, usually can find them at the head of the lagoon is another place uh, on the freshwater side of the dike there. Uh, I have seen them in Oak Bluffs Harbor on occasion, but it, it pretty much is a freshwater bird. And that helps because you won't often, uh, you know, see it in waters where you're seeing scop, which prefer brackish and salt water. So that is probably enough. I want to say a couple of things here. Uh, first of all, I really gratefully acknowledge all of the observers on iNaturalist uh, who posted photos of their ducks uh, using a Creative Commons license that makes them available for educational purposes like this. 
Well, you may have seen the article on iNaturalist on the front page of the Boston Globe the other day about how it is a bastion of civility and cooperation in a, worldly, in a world that badly needs both of those things. And it really is true. I post all of my observations with uh, Creative Commons license and most uh, INAT observers do the same thing. And I think that's a, a wonderful thing. So I'm grateful to all the people whose photographs were available to me because I'm not much of a bird photographer. Um, <clears throat> and I wanna check the chat. Uh, freshwater kettle pond on Cape Cod and I regularly see uh, common golden eyes in the winter. Yes, point, uh, point well taken. You do see common uh, golden eyes on fresh water. Uh, you get large numbers of them uh, uh, on the brackish, in the brackish ponds on the vineyard. Uh, Thaw and Cynthia are asking um, about the plumages of ducks. Um, the duck molt is kind of a weird thing. They go into what's called an eclipse plumage after the breeding season and are in a very dull plumage, all of them for a while. Uh, when they show up here though, they both basically have molted into uh, their, what will be their breeding plumage in the spring again. So uh, fall and winter, they usually show uh, their characteristic plumages, but remember that a lot of birds uh, don't necessarily mature their first year. So with a bird like common eider, you get various forms of immatures that can be uh, a little bit bewildering. Um, Scop and scoter is equally popular. Um, I assume popular means uh, uh, numerous. Uh, I happen to like them both, so I think they're both popular. Um, uh, scoter are probably are more numerous, uh, and they turn up more widely around the vineyard. That's partly because scops are highly gregarious, and you tend to get all of the scop in one area concentrated in one flock. But on a Christmas bird count, we will see typically quite a few hundreds or thousands of the scoter species and maybe a few hundred of the scop species. So they're different in, in abundance by perhaps an order of magnitude in, in a typical winter. Uh, every winter is different. So uh, um, any other questions, you could feel free to unmute yourself if uh, you want to ask a question instead of chatting it. Um, I also am cognizant of the fact that we've I've taken up the full hour here, so I don't want to uh, keep you from your adult beverage or your dinner, whichever comes first. Great, I think we're done then. I thank you very, very much for your interest and for your attendance. Um, I encourage you again to uh, attend some uh, Martha's Vineyard Bird Club events and to check out the birding material on the Atlas of Life website. Uh, I encourage you again to bird every chance you get. Keep your binoculars with you at all times. Okay, you never know. Um, uh, pull over to the side of the road when you see a duck and try to identify it. Uh, this is how you're going to learn. Uh, bird with other birders. Um, Get a field guide, uh, study it before you go into the field, study it when you get home to refresh your memory and try to identify every single bird you see, even though you're assured that you're never actually going to be able to do that. But the point is the exercise, train your brain, get it used to asking questions and noticing things. And over time, you will start to learn what are reliable field marks. You'll cultivate the judgment to know when you should be calling them scop species or scoter species, or when you feel can actually sep separate them out to greater or lesser scop or uh, black or uh, black or um, white winged or surf scoters and so on down the line. Birding is fun. Uh, I wish you a lot of joy with it. I wish you joy for the holiday season and I hope to see some of you in the field. Thanks again for coming, been a pleasure. Thank you, Matt.